So good morning everyone. It is so incredibly awesome to be here. There is something really quite magical to think that all over the world this same conversation with 205 other variants of the interpretation of the theme is happening. And when you talk about community building, that is indeed building one very big conversation, which is awesome. So I know you feel as delighted just watching you all interact before. There is a palpable energy in the room, Phoebe. So congratulations for bringing this to us. Because sometimes we get a little bit busy and we forget to look up and look out to the world and see what else is happening and see what we can be part of. So thank you. The end of a story. The end of a story, the end of a chapter in our lives, the end of a normal day is actually the beginning of a new something. So live in that moment with an eye on the future. It is about understanding that our actions influence, influence all that happens around us. It influences what happens to us and, it, we, and, it, and things happen because of us. Today I echo the sentiment of T.S. Eliot who said the end is in the beginning. Perhaps this might be an oversimplistic approach to describing life, but there's no escaping the implication of the terminology like life cycle when it comes to our human story, to the way we live physically, and that includes how we live culturally, financially, and of course, mentally. I share with you today the end in the context of literature. It's my thing, particularly children's picture books. It's really my thing, as it relates so significantly to the beginning. I can't actually write a book, I can't even start a story, a manuscript for a novel, a cookbook, a children's book, anything that I do, unless I can actually see and have a very firm vision of what the end actually looks like. I really do need to know what the last sentence sounds like, what the image on the back of the book looks like, and I actually even know what that feeling of conclusion that comes from shutting the back cover and turning it over and that sense of fulfillment, having finished something amazing, and then I can start. This has been my creative quirk since I've been writing, and it really has been a matter of watching the movie in my head as I wander around. Hopefully not as I'm driving, but that might happen. <laughs> so excuse me if I'm doing something crazy in the car. When I get a sense of that conclusion and the finality, that might be the end, but for me it is actually the beginning. It's the beginning of the writing process and regardless of whether your style is to simply let the words flow and you fly by the seat of your pants and voila, you have a story, or if your style of that is that of an intense planner, someone who actually creates chapter outlines, character studies, settings pre-described, you do, regardless, have to actually start what can only be described as a period of intensely hard work. Sure, you may have intermittent successes where the most mellifluous sentences flow, only to have to kill your darlings, a reference to that savagery that comes from deleting the sentences that you yourself are holding in high admiration. You've actually written it. It's awesome. It's got to go. <laughs> it's the hours and hours and hours of solitude. For those who know me, being by myself for that long is not necessarily a good thing for my mental health. But it is hours and hours of solitude. You're in your head, yet in your head there is a world. There are conversations. There are people competing for your attention. There are settings that are de determining what you're going to do next. There is a world in there that is in pain. They laugh, they cry, they have weaknesses, they have foibles. Their strengths astound you and sometimes their behaviour disappoints you. These characters and their stories really do become part of your own world. Stories then become part of your world as a writer, but for every single one of us, stories are so intrinsically part of our DNA. Christopher Booker, in his definitive work, Why We Tell Stories, says stories take place in the human imagination around certain archetypal patterns and images which are the common property of mankind. Everyone owns the story. He shows us how then how these stories are simply formed in patterns and how a satisfying story as it ends always returns to a beginning. My understanding of stories is that they can actually also follow our personal growth and I mean that from a child developing to an adult. Regardless of the story there is one essential ingredient. It is the hero. 
This is how innate the human response is to, how, to the universality of us, how inspiring we think the hero is. The hero, the one who answers the call. He's the one who jumps into the action. He's the brave, the industrious, the problem solver. We worship these people in our day-to-day -day living in every culture. These heroes are the founders of religious instruction. Muslims for Muhammad, Christians have Jesus, but we also have cultural heroes. Think of how the Australians respond to the Anzac story and Anzacs themselves, to the VC winners, to anyone who serves our country. Consider how the Americans review firemen and women. Then look at the broader picture, the indelible legacy that we all hold universally as our own when we think of individuals like Mother Teresa, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King. All they did was step forward and answer the hero's call. So back to our development. Think of it as a child. Our development, as does our heroes, start as we actually embrace the oldest living, the oldest known storyline, overcoming the monster. The community, yes, and the hero is fearful of the unknown. And the hero answers the call and sets off. He is going to smite that monster. After a number of attempts to slay the monster, always three, he is he, <laughs> and you know that that lady is intermittently changed with she, <laughs> um, he miraculously succeeds. And that is the miraculous succession or succeeding. There's not much of a writer. Um, <laughs> miraculously succeeding and at the end makes the land peaceful again. He returns to the village. He is the victor. He has made change. He has changed his community for the good. And at the end of the story, it is the beginning of another period of peace, either for the community at large. And also, there's the internal battle. It could be internally in an emotional sense for the hero. Does this story resonate with you? Sound familiar at all, Phoebe? <laughs> we practiced this yesterday. Phoebe. <laughs> Does Jack and the Beanstalk, well done. You did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now we can kick start off from the rest of it. So I'll help you with this one. But the, this story is so familiar to us in every sense. You've got Jack and the Beanstalk, but how about Little Red Riding Hood, Hansel and Gretel, James Bond, and go back to the first piece of writing ever discovered by humans on the cuneiform, on the tablets in the desert, in the, in the Sumerian desert, the epic battle of Gilgamesh. Okay, consider the second type of story now. I believe it's really a useful story for children's picture book writers to explain the challenges of going to school for the first time. And indeed, it could be the experiment with life that is the domain of the teenage years. And you're all too old for that. <laughs> Same. <laughs> It is the voyage and return plot. The hero travels out to a world distinctly different and then is cut off from his own familiar one. It is an experience that at first is intensely pleasurable and then it quickly gets out of control. And it's up to the hero to make the choices to follow those who are good and who are evil. The hero eventually does and miraculously returns home with nothing to show from the experience except for personal growth and development and a surety in their, own in their own ability to make decisions in the future, their own beginning. Is there a familiar feel to that? This is why I get to say Brahman and she says, you didn't give me the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Even if I give you a moment, why don't I just help you? Uh, there are amazing examples that I know will resonate with you. Alice in Wonderland, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. As she sets off, finds herself in that new house. At first, it's incredibly exciting and then experiments and has three goes at it. And each time in the three, there are three attempts at everything. And then she hears the bears and she jumps out the window and pops home. So... <laughs> But there are also bigger stories like Gone with the Wind, Wizard of Oz, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. We move to the next plot. Consider this, as we age our connection with home changes and simply being at home can induce a state of wretchedness. I am talking about those teenage years. And surely there is a better place than this. People, aka most likely mothers, make the space intolerable. <laughs> and the hero, sets off even though they're actually not quite ready to strike out on their own. The mother watches and knows that they will be back in time for dinner. <laughs> of course, as the hero gets out and starts experimenting in the world and they do meet people, the clock chimes and they are returned to their same dull, dreary existence. 
back with their mother for dinner. Whilst our hero has conducted him or herself admirably in that other world, it is the hero's new friends that he made that come to save him. All right, I'm going to help you on this one. Yes, it is the Cinderella story of rags to riches, the transition for a child to a young adult, the taking of control as adults and making choices about the people we choose as influencers. Rags to riches is a Disney staple. Any stories that you can think of? Disney? No? Hmm? Aladdin, The Ugly Duckling, King Arthur, My Fair Lady, Superman. <laughs> Now it is time for the quest. And as humans, we seek a mate. And if we're not seeking a mate, we actually seek a system of belief, a belonging. To be the decision maker ourselves though, which is a fundamental difference. How then do we know how to choose between right and wrong? The hero answers the call and with friends, come on, they were just a teenager moments ago, just experimenting. But with friends, feels the call, sets off, meets monsters and survives has to deal with temptation and ignores it, and then moves on to deal with the challenge of the deadly opposites. The hero makes the right decision to arrive, uh, only then to arrive to have to deal with the final ordeal. The hero has to step up. He has to make the decisions. His friends have been there and might have given him clues, but if he doesn't make that decision, he is not going to learn as a first-hander. Of course, he su succeeds and he proves that he has courage within and he triumphs. It's only anecdotal and you might crucify me for this, but truly primary school age little boys absolutely adore this plot line above all else. Can any of you think of any others that suit this, any other stories that suit this at all? Star <laughs> Yes, 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 absolutely. Lord of the Rings, Raiders of the Lost Ark, the, the, the Treasure Island and Star Wars, but of course for the kids, Del Toro Quest. It's even got the quest in the word, which is good. So we know as humans that we're not always perfect and this brings us then to the story of rebirth. The hero falls under the power of a dark force and I defy anyone in this room not to identify with this with at some point in their adolescence or yesterday. <laughs> the hero falls under the power of a dark force and at first it's not so bad. The hero changes behaviours to accommodate the force. Things seem to ha just keep happening however and it just gets worse and worse and worse. There is an offer an olive leaf, if you like, olive branch, yes, olive branch, and it's from an external force. In storytelling, it's often from a young girl or an elderly man, and everyone loves Dumbledore. <laughs> there is an offer for it to help, and the hero accepts. The hero knows to accept help, which is also another mental health story, but the hero offers, accepts, and agrees to the transformative action that is required to bring him back into the community and in doing so becomes a better person. These can be sometimes challenging to identify, but they do again fit brilliantly into the Disney cachet. Remember that the, the character is not necessarily loved by the reader. Does that feel vaguely? Not really. Um, <laughs> sleepy. It is early and the coffee hasn't kicked in. That's all right. Don't worry, the kids don't get it either. Um, how about, well, Sleeping Beauty. We actually don't even know her name, but it's a story. The Frog Prince, Beauty and the Beast, The Snow Queen, A Secret Garden, A Christmas Carol. They all tell the same thing. So then, with those, we've got five plot lines under our belt. That is our whole entire development from woe to go, from birth to grave. But it is easy then to understand what is tragedy. And I mean tragedy as in tragedy, not Boo-hoo, it's a bit sad, you know, dry your eyes, princess. <laughs> Get a cat of toughen up. Um, tragedy is the character's flaw makes the hero, you know, we understand instinctively that the character is flawed from the get-go. They make poor choices, which means that when they come up against the monster, they're smited by the monster. They are unable to return on their voyage. They do not succeed in the quest. They're unable to escape the wretchedness imposed by others or they miss those opportunities to start again. Think of the constriction you feel when you know the character is so fundamentally flawed that they will never find peace. The reason we have these stories in our, in our community is so that we can identify with, the, with these characters in our own world and not be caught in their vortex and not allow ourselves to be caught in that vortex. Does anyone have any thoughts about what those stories could be? Macbeth. Macbeth. Game of Thrones, 
it is winter. I don't even know. I've never watched one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too busy writing this speech, Phoebe. Um, <laughs> but there's also Anna Karenina. We do have Macbeth, Bonnie and Clyde. Julius Caesar, the picture of Dorian Gray, the bridge to Terabithia. I spoke to a little boy yesterday and he was really, you know, vying for my attention when I talked about tragedy as a plot line. And he wanted to tell me about Bridge of Terabithia because he said at the beginning, as soon as he met her, I can't remember the name, as soon as he met that character, he knew it was not going to work out for her. And he thought that was very, very sad. And that's what a tragedy gives you. Regardless of which storyline you find yourself killed up in, the end of each experience, we move on. We transform, we change. And it doesn't always mean it's that intense sliding door moment. It is, our, it is the reaction to our actions, big and small, day in and day out. At the end of every action that we make, there is a response, a beginning. It is a matter, it is a moment that we have that epiphany of that impact that matters. For the children then, I describe the hero's journey, something that seems accidental. It's, uh, it's, it is accidental. But in the end, it is dictated by the hero's actions all along the way. And I say to the children to picture themselves walking along a riverbank. I say, you know, you're completely relaxed, you're daydreaming, you've forgotten to go home and do your homework. Nothing distinguishable in your head, you're just having a lovely time. You stub your toe and you, you shake out of that trance-like state. And instinctively, you look down and you see a really interesting rock. Curious, you pick it up and you examine it a little closer. It's a little slippery. You have to wrangle it just in order to get a good grasp on it. It's slightly oversized in your hand. It's muddy, there are clumps of soil peering from the natural indentations and nevertheless you cannot let go of it. You hear the call. Squatting down on the river's edge, your toes tickling the water's edge, you... Oh, quick, write that down. <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh, you've recorded it. Um, you wash the stone backwards and forwards in the current, dislodging some of the mud. The natural colour of the new of the stone is now visible and you are content just staring at it. But you're mesmerised. You're, you're, you're actually intrigued. Reaching down to the water again, you find another stone and you actually start to do something. You grind the hard edges off. It keep, there's an edge that keeps catching in your palm, but you do something and it's starting to get really special. You feel as though you really must show someone. You spin around, you leap up from the bank, you trip over the grasses and fall heavily. The rock, rock tumbles from your hand, striking a much larger boulder to your right. The sound is sickening and you involuntary grimace, shutting your eyes tightly. When you open your eyes again, you see with great despair the perfect stone is broken into two pieces. Picking up both, you tentatively look and very quickly dismiss one piece. It's banal, nothing special, you toss it away. The other piece though, well, just the sight of it and you've caught your breath. For within the rough exterior, something glints. You catch a ray of sunshine. It is absolutely beautiful. Quickly then you go back to the river. You find that hard stone. You begin grinding away at the outside. It takes an eternity. But you don't even notice. The shadows lengthen and the sun fold the day into the hills behind you. You are in complete control. It is time to go home. It is the end of your walk, the end of your inspirational discovery. Yet, it is actually the beginning. It is time to show others what you have discovered, what you know about yourself. For in your own hands, you have your own perfect gem. It is now up to you to share what you've learned and what you've discovered and importantly what you understand about yourself and what your impact is upon the world. For what may seem simply to be the end and the end of this speech, you possibly have had some thoughts and you will respond to today in your own way. You now have your own beginning. Thank you. <laughs> I like having you here. <laughs>